<laughs> Hi. Living free from the wise. James 1, 2-4 tells us, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. In the truly inspiring words of Chuck Swindle, we are all faced with a series of great opportunities, brilliantly disguised as impossible situations. Living free from the wise. Want to know more? Hang around. Welcome, welcome to Lions Roar 38 Ministries. Amos 38 tells us, A lion has roared who will not hear or fear. The Lord God has spoken who can but prophesy. My name is George Magalhães and we are an apostolic ministry with a prophetic teaching edge. It is our mission, our passion to reignite, equip and release Christ-like disciples both locally and globally. We do that through our itinerant ministry, but as well as providing with resources just like this one to help you, to aid you in your God-given calling. Today, I want to talk to you about living free from the wise. Living free from the wise. You know, the wise. Why me, Lord? Why am I still waiting? Why, why, why? Living free from the wise bringing us to our main verse today, which we heard at the beginning. This time, I'm going to be reading from the message version. James 1, 2 to 4. Consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. That is brilliantly explained on what we are going to be discussing today. Now, last week, if I'm not mistaken, we had the revival night. Uh, on the weekend, I went and preached here uh, locally in Ballarat in Voice of Grace Church. We spoke, I spoke about... Um, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? So I spoke about identity. And at the at the end, I did mention, I did touch a little bit on these two. And I'm saying two because we're going to be talking, discussing, and answering these two main questions. When I say main, I mean these are the two main questions, most obvious, most um, um the, the most questions, the, like the ones that we get most of the time when we are ministering and that is why me and the second one is why am i still waiting we're gonna now dive into that so make it into a sort of like a q a even though you don't really get to ask the question the two questions that are already provided but we're going to be answering that because a lot of christians especially in the times that we are living in when things are heating up when persecution is increasing when evil and darkness just seems to be getting darker and darker and more and more evil. Nevertheless, we must not forget that we have the light of God in us. We have God himself, the joy of the indwelling Holy Spirit living in us. Plus, Christ Jesus, the hope of glory in us. We are one with Christ Jesus. Amen. So we must not forget that. Leading us to, <coughs> excuse me. Leading us to John 10.10. 10. Yes, let me mention this one before we start. John 10.10 10 in the Amplified Classic says, The thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. I came that, I, that they, they who, us, and who comes to steal? Kill and destroy the devil, the thief. Do not, do not hold on to that absolute deceitful demonic message that oh, God is trying to put me through a test. Oh, you know, God is 
punishing me for something. No, God is not doing any of that. God is absolutely good. He does not do any of those things at all. The thief, the devil, is the one who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Not God. God, even Jesus, said this. I came that they may have what? That they may have and enjoy life. And have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. Amen. Let's keep that in our minds as we discuss these two questions today. Leading us to our first question. Why me? How many of us throughout life have said to God, cried out to God, why me, Lord? Why me? Whether it's because of issues, problems, whatever it may be, in, in, in like in a negative way that it's impacting our life, or whether it's even in a positive way, like, that sounds great, Lord, but you know, why me? There's somebody better out there. I, I don't need this. I, I, I'm not that equipped. I'm not well equipped. Remember Moses? I, I can't even speak that well, Lord. Why me? So whatever position, whatever situation you're in, this question, every one of us, one way or another, have always, have always, have somehow asked this question along the way, maybe more than once, and I'm pretty sure it would have been more than once. I've done it. <laughs> so why me? Well, one of the reasons, one of the reasons why it is you, why it is me, is character building. Character building. But before I get onto character building, we need to realize that everything in our lives is for the glory of God, the good and the bad. Because God does not waste even the bad, even the bad things that the enemy throws in our lives, even the attacks and the persecution and the trials and temptations and all those things. God always uses everything. He, he, he does not waste anything that comes our way. He always turns everything around for good. Listen to this, John 9, John 9, 1 to 3. And I'm reading from the Amplified Classic, John 9, 1 to 3. As he passed along, he noticed a man blind from his birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, talking to Jesus, obviously, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man or his parents sinned. But he was born blind in order that the workings of God should be manifested, displayed, and illustrated in him. Other versions say, so that the glory of God, or so that the workings of God, sorry, may be glorified, that God may be glorified through this as a testimony, in other words. Why am I mentioning this verse? How many of us have also heard or had people tell us, oh, well, you're going through that because you must have done something wrong nonsense. Most of the time, it's not even us. We didn't even do anything wrong most of the times. I'm not saying we don't sin. Everybody sins and falls short of, falls short of the glory of God. The, the Word of God is very clear about that. And when I mean sin, I don't mean just intentional sin, even accidental sin. And even as the Word of God tells us, if you know what is good and you don't do it, that's considered sin. So sin isn't just the bad things we do, isn't just the things we don't do that we should do. But sin is also, listen to this, as the Word of God tells us, anything that is not done from faith is sin. That's in the Word of God. Anything that is not faith of faith is sin. So we all sin. However, that does not make us sinners. And, and wait a second, what, what I'm trying to say here is in terms of identity, you are not what you do anymore. You are not a sinner in terms of identity. You still sin, but you are not a sinner anymore in the eyes of God. You are righteous now because of what Jesus Christ done on the cross. His righteousness for our unrighteousness. He took upon himself. He became sin. Not just the sins of the past, present, and future, but the nature of sin itself was killed on that cross, was conquered. He fulfilled the law. He became the complete fulfillment of the law. And when you put faith in Christ Jesus, when you put faith in Christ Jesus, you are automatically, in God's eyes, 
the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Remember that because we come, become one in spirit with Christ. And everything we do in life, remember, we still sin. So it's not that we're fake Christians. Stop using that word, people. If you use that word, don't use that word anymore. Uh, he's just a fake Christian because the majority of us, a majority of Christians, brothers and sisters, it's not that a lot of them aren't even doing things intentionally. It's ignorance. It's in the Bible. It says that my people perish for a lack of knowledge. It's ignorance. So let us show grace to our brothers and sisters, especially, and help them through that situation. Because, as I said, a lot of the time it's ignorance. It's not oh, they've done this, that's why they're suffering, or they've done that, or they don't carry enough power or anointing. Now, every single one of us have the same Holy Spirit. Every single one of us has the kingdom of God within us, Luke 17, every single one of us. How much we decide and how much we activate, how much we use, well, it all depends on our free will and how much we use. Amen? So, it's all for the glory of God. Again, James 1, 2-4. James 1, 2-4, in the New King James ver Version, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patient, patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. In other words, don't despise the trials. Because trials, even if they come from the devil, even if they come from the enemy, God will use those trials to, um, to sharpen, to, uh, to mold us in Christ's likeness. He uses it for good, remember? So don't prematurely, as we heard in the message version, and I've got it here somewhere, as we heard in the mes message, let me bring it up again, as you can see there in the message version, uh, so don't try to get out of anything prematurely don't try to get out of prematurely god has a perfect system of seed time and harvest he knows when it's the right time for us to get through it not out of it through it amen hebrews 12 verse 6 hebrews 12 verse 6 in the voice translation says for the lord disciplines those he loves and he corrects each one he takes as his own. In fact, in I'm pretty sure it's in Proverbs, it says those that God loves, he chastens. Chastens means he he disciplines. If he, if, if let's be real here. What parent doesn't discipline their child? Only one that does not love them. If they don't care about that child, they'll just let them run around, do whatever they like. But those that really love their children, they discipline them. They correct them for their own good. Amen. Likewise with God. So sometimes it's also got to do with that. Why me? Because sometimes it's got to do with that. Now, going back to that character building, we need to realize that God is not preparing what's next for us. God is preparing us for what's next. Remember about that character building? God is not preparing what's next for us. So don't be asking God, God, when are you going to do this? When are you going to do that? Why me? When are you going to do this? So the prophet said this. The prophet said that. Don't you think God already knows what the prophet said? He spoke through the prophet. Don't you think God already knows what he planned for you? Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's workmanship. His, his other translation says his most prized possession, his most unique priceless possession. But workmanship means also a piece that is being worked on by the master, uh, it's not builder, by the master, um, I forgot what the name is. Uh, I forgot the name of it. <laughs> Molder, somebody who molds a piece. He's the master. But then he goes on to say, created unto good works, which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. When was these works, these prophetic words, these expected ends that were given to you, when were they created? Which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So he's already prepared it. In other words, he's not preparing what's next for you. It's What's next for you, it's already prepared. What he's preparing is you for what's next. 
so that you are ready. He, won't, he doesn't want you to be prematurely uh, enter into a stage, a phase in your life where you will not be able to handle. Or worse yet, where not only will you uh, damage you yourself, but you will damage others around you. God doesn't want that. That's why there is seed, time, and harvest. 1 Peter, listen to this, 1 Peter 6 to 7. 1 Peter 6 to 7 in the New King James Version. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness, genuineness of your faith, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Even though you're going through all those trials, all those persecutions, all those things, keep holding on to your faith. Because it's like we say here in Australia, down under, we say when the rubber hits the road, that means when, when the pressure is on, when the fire is on, that's when we really see what our faith is made up of, isn't it? So that we must hold on to that faith if we want to grow more mature and we want to grow more in Christ's likeness. And the more we hold on to it and the more we overcome, the more praise and glory God gets. But we don't do it out of striving and out of our flesh. Our job is to put faith in him to put faith in his word, to believe and know that he is with us and he is our helper. He's the one helping us through that process. He's the one giving us the strength, the wisdom, the discernment and all the gifts that we need in order to continue to grow in Christ's likeness, in order to continue to live the abundant life that he wants us to live, in order to keep going and overcoming and conquering and taking territory and bringing heaven on earth. Amen. We have to realize and never forget that we were made for God's glory. We were made for his glory. And God went, wants servant kings, not kings of servants. He wants servant kings, not kings of servants. He wants humble servants, not ruthless masters. So why me? You know why you. I know why me. Don't we? So whenever we face a trial, we're not going to go weird and hallelujah. I'm not saying that. But at the same time, don't panic. Do not fear. Fear not. God is with us. Whatever we face. Why am I still waiting though, George? That's the second question. And the reality is a lot of people want to know this question more than anything. Because a lot of Christians, no matter how young or how mature they are, a lot of them pretty much have an, a bit of an idea, why me? But this question, why am I still waiting, is the one that really troubles a lot of Christians. And a lot of the time, unfortunately, even uh, some Christians end up backsliding, getting away from God, because they just can't handle they just can't understand why I'm doing everything right. I'm doing this. Lord, why, why am I still waiting? Why isn't this still happening? Well, one of those reasons why, uh, why we still wait, first of all, let me mention this because this is important. I mentioned just before. We have to realize that there is a seed, time, and harvest. There is a seed, time, and harvest. God set up a perfect system in the world. And everything, if you want to reap a harvest, whether it's a harvest in your marriage, whether it's a harvest in your finances, whether it's a harvest in your, in your uh, finances, whether it's a, whatever it is, there has to be a seed sown. If you don't have the seed, ask God for a seed. And I'm not just talking about financially. There's always a seed that has to be sown in order to reap a harvest. If you spend, for example, most, even non, even uh, pre, I say pre-Christians as in non-Christians, but successful ones, business people will tell you, if all you do is spend all your week, most of your week, just sleeping or uh, 
reading comics or playing games or what we call here in Australia, bludging. That's a seed that you are sowing. And you will reap a harvest out of that. We have to understand that there's always a seed in order for you to reap a harvest. So keep that in mind. Why am I still waiting? Well, sometimes it's got to do with a seed, time and harvest. A lot of the times it's got to do with that, actually. And one of them may be comfort and complacency, which is one of the th reasons why the world is in the condition we are. Let's be real here. Let's be honest. We, the church, we, the church, have grown too comfort, too comfortable and too complacent. That's why you see the West going down the drain at the moment. But look at Africa. Look at Korea. Not, uh, South Korea, I'm talking about. Look at China. Look at Iran. Fastest growing churches in the world, in the midst of the worst persecution. They're growing dramatically. And not just growing, they're sending out the most missionaries in the world now. It used to be America. Used to be. I don't know if it's gone back to America, but a few years back when I was in Bible college, I learned about that. And, and, and it was actually Korea at one time, Korea and China, which had outgrown America in terms of sending out Christians into the world. Because now they were able to go to places where a lot of Americans, because of political reasons and wars and all that, couldn't go. Comfort and complacency is a big issue in the church, the big issue with believers. Mark 4.19 tells us in the Amplified Classic, Mark 4.19, then the cares and the anxieties of the world and distractions, distractions, that's talking about distractions, comfort, complacency. We start taking on idols and things that we start taking for granted God. We start taking God for granted and the people that beside us and the struggles that we went through and the victories that we we conquered because of God and and it becomes a distraction other things start taking place things start getting unprioritized in the wrong order that's why it says that then the cares and anxieties of the world and distractions of the age and the pleasure and delight and false glamour and deceitfulness of riches and the craving and passionate desire for other things creep in and choke and suffocate the word, and it becomes fruitless. Hmm. So that word that you had for many years ago, that expected, it's in the word of God, in King James Version, authorized King James says, the expected end, which is talking about that dream, that prophetic word, that, that big, that, um, end from the beginning, as the word of God says, that God reveals the end from the beginning, in order to motivate us and all that sort of stuff. You have to keep holding on to it. Don't become obsessed with it, but you have to hold on to that promise of God. And you have to keep your eyes focused on Jesus and continue to do the right thing. Live the way that God's called you to live. And Holy Spirit will help you through that. But if you keep ignoring every now and then, because thing, you, you, all of a sudden you're starting to get more famous, in whatever situation, I'm not talking just in ministry, but you become more famous in your job, you start becoming a boss, you're this, this and that, and then you get arrogant, and then you start ignoring God, you don't really need Him now, because now you're successful. That's when comfort and complacency uh, uh, creeps in. That's when that those vanity, those glamours and the false glamour creeps in and starts choking and suffocating that promise of God that God's given you. Again, seed, time, and harvest. Genesis 8, 22 says, While the earth remains, Genesis 8, 22, While the earth remains, seed, time, and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Wow. Galatians 6, verse 9. Galatians 6, verse 9 in the Amplified Classic and let us not lose heart and grow weary and faint in acting nobly and doing right. For in due time, in due season, in other words, seed time and harvest is talking about again. And at the appointed season, we shall reap. There's the seed 
Where's the sea, George? And let us not lose heart and grow weary and faint in acting nobly and doing right. Acting nobly and doing right is the seed. For in due time, that's the time, and at the appointed season, season we shall reap, and there's the harvest. If we do not loosen and relax our courage and faint. Mark 4, 26 to 29. Mark 4, 26 to 29, Amplified Classic. And he said, the kingdom of God is like a man who scatters seeds upon the earth and then continues sleeping and rising night and day while the seed sprouts and grows and increases. He knows not how. The earth produces, acting by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe and permits, immediately he sends forth the reapers, the harvesters, in other words, and puts in the sickle. Because the harvest stands ready. God is saying, if you plant the seed, in time, you will reap a harvest. So one of the reasons why we're not waiting, it's got to do with complacency. It's got to do with the fact that we do not quite understand that there is a seed time and harvest. You can't expect a harvest without planting a seed. A future and a hope. We have to remember this, that God wants a future and a hope for us. A good future and hope. Jeremiah 29, 11. Many of you know this. Jeremiah 29, 11, the New King James Version. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you a future and a hope. And a very good future at that. He wants to give you. So there is no such thing as false hope. Stop using those words. Don't say that. Oh, it's just a ma it's just a saying, George. I'm not being pedantic here, but the more you speak those things, the more it becomes part of your vocabulary. And as Christians, there is power in the, in, in the tongue. We have power of life and death in the tongue. What we say about others and what we say about us. So you're better off just not saying those nonsenses. And, if, and I, still, I still try and, 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 and stop myself because I'm still trying to stop myself from saying specific words every now and then. I'm still, God is still working on me. So don't be too hard on yourself because God will continue to work on you. Our role, again, I'm saying, is to make the decision to change, to say, yes, Lord, continue your good work of grace in me. Continue to transform me in Christ's likeness. But we need to say yes to him. There is no such thing as false hope, remember that, as believers. For we can't please God without faith, remember that. Hebrews 11 verse 6, we cannot please God without faith. And faith is what? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. There you go, we need hope. The world needs hope. And they can only find it in Jesus Christ. He is the only truth, way and life. Amen? So faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, Hebrews 11 verse 1. The evidence of things not seen. Not, oh well, I'll believe it when I see it, George. Nonsense. You believe it, then you see it. You must believe before you see it. That is how we are meant to live as Christians. We live by faith, not by sight. We walk after the Spirit, not after the flesh. Amen? Christ in us the hope of glory. Colossians 1.27 the, the world needs hope. And you and I are that hope. Because we carry Christ Jesus, the hope of glory in us. We carry his word. You and I are the voices of God. His instruments that he chooses to use. Think about this. He's the head, Jesus Christ. We are the body. The head controls the body. But the head cannot do anything without the body. I, what are you saying, George? That's blasphemy. Are you saying Jesus can't do anything? Jesus can do anything he wants. He's God. But God has chosen, our Trinity Godhead has chosen to act through the body. We can't do anything without God, but God won't do anything without us. Remember that. 
We can't do anything without God, but God won't do anything without us. So prophecy, those expected end, those words that you are given. Remember, prophecy is, is, is um, God's spoiler alert. It really is. It's God's spoiler alert revealing the harvest, but rarely the seed. Have you noticed that? Think about it. Prophecy is God's spoiler alert, usually revealing the harvest. That's why we get so excited. Wow! But rarely the seed. We cannot forget that there has to be a seed sown. There has to be time for it to start growing. And then we'll reap the harvest. Isaiah 46.10. Listen to this. Isaiah 46.10 in the New King James Version. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things that are not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand. And I will do my pleasure. Does it take pleasure in seeing you succeed? Yes. Does it take pleasure in seeing you healthy? Yes. Does it take pleasure in seeing your marriage flourish? Yes. Does it take pleasure in you being successful and being... Uh, uh, rich is not the right word, but being prosperous? Yes. Because all those things will glorify him. You are Christ ambassadors. We are Christ ambassadors. Proverbs, Proverbs 23, 18, in the authorized King James Version says, For surely there is an end. And thine expectation, your expectation, in other words, shall not be cut off. He will not allow it to be cut off. If he's shown it to you, he will fulfill it because he's faithful to his word above all things. Jeremiah 29, 11, we all heard this just before, and I'm saying it from the King James Version now. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Here you go. There's his, there's his promise. I will give you an expected end. Habakkuk 2, verse 2. This one we must not forget, because a lot of us don't do this. Habakkuk 2, verse 2. In the New King James Version, write the vision in other words, write that expected end, write what is revealed to you, and make it plain on tablets. Obviously that today, tablets can mean the tablets, computers, whatever, diaries, whatever you want to do. That he, he who, you may run who reads it. Run, run what? Run the race. Finish the race and keep the faith, as Paul said. Our role here on earth it's not to enjoy and have a party and relax. We have a mission, a commission to go throughout the world and make everybody reconcile to our God. That is our mission. And because we have that mission, we need to, to make things clear, to keep the, prior, our, the right priorities visible because it's so easy for us to get distracted. So if you, if you need, I'm not making this a religious thing. I'm just saying you benefit from this. Write it down. Write that vision down. Record it on your phone like I've done in many prophetic words. And every now and then listen to it to encourage you, to motivate you, to lift up your spirit. But remember, you must not get obsessed about this. This is to keep you going. This is to give you that strength for the journey. That's the harvest. But you still got that seed and time that you need to go through. But it doesn't, things don't seem clear, George. Well, clarity comes in the journey. Don't just sit on your butt and expect everything to be done by God. I'll just fall into place. It doesn't work like that. Clarity comes with a journey. God works in us and through us as we walk through the journey. As you're going. What did he do with the disciples? He didn't just say, come with me for the next two and a half years. Uh, sit down every single day. I'm going to bombard you theology. And then for the next half a year, then we'll go out. No, they learnt along the way. They made a lot of mistakes, but they learnt along the way. God worked on them and then worked through them along the journey. Amen. Likewise, that's how it works with us. Clarity comes with the journey in the good and the bad. The end of ourselves ushers the beginning of God. What does that mean? It means that we must work faith. You see, faith works when we work faith. Think about this. Faith works when we work faith. In other words, faith without works is dead. 
It's not enough just to know. It's not enough just to know. It's not enough just to hear. We must be doers of the word. Faith works when we work faith. James 1.22. James 1.22 in the Amplified Classic. But be doers of the word. Obey the message and do not merely lit and do and not merely, sorry, and not merely listeners to it. Betraying yourselves into deception by reasoning contrary to the truth. Wow. James 1.25 in the Amplified Classic. James 1.25. But he who looks carefully into the faultless law, the law of liberty, talking about the word of God, and is faithful to it and perseveres in looking into it, perseveres, being not a heedless listener who forgets, but an active doer who obeys, he shall or she shall be blessed in his doing, his life of obedience. You will be blessed. Matthew 7, 24. Matthew 7, 24 in the Amplified Classic. So everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them, obeying them, will be like a sensible, prudent, practical, wise man who built his house upon the rock. Listen to this very carefully, because I don't think you've picked it up. So everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them, obeying them, will be like a sensible man who built his house upon the rock. What are you talking about, George? It doesn't say here, so everyone who hears these words of mine and and acts upon them perfectly doesn't say that it says acts upon them obeying them so god doesn't expect perfection because he's already perfect his perfect son is in us his perfect spirit is in us what he expects is obedience you see obedience that's why the word tells us that obedience is better than sacrifice he doesn't ignore the sacrifice, but he values obedience more than sacrifice. Likewise, all he wants is our heart. He wants us to keep being obedient to him. Whether we do it perfectly or not, doesn't matter. He will keep perfecting us. But it's that surrender to him, that act of obedience constantly, that will get us to where he promised us to go. You see, that's why identity, and I've been bombarding this and hammering this for the last few weeks or maybe a few months now, and God's been bombarding that to, to us as well. So much go revising our, our identity over the last uh, um, few years, especially because of what the world's gone through. This pressure that's, co that's come upon society, these, um, this corruption and evil that we see in the world, so much has put so much pressure, has put a lot of Christians in a position of so much fear and, 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 um, and I guess surprise, because a, a, lot of, a lot of Christians have found out that what they thought they knew, they don't really know. There's a difference between head knowledge and revelation knowledge. And it's only when things heat up that we truly know how, where we are with our faith. And if we don't know our identity, we run around like headless chickens. Because we will be fearful more of men than we are fearful of God. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, the Word of God tells us. If we don't fear God and we fear men more, and we fear the things of this world more, then we are not being led by the Spirit, are we? We are being led by the flesh. So we must understand that our identity, our being, who we are, manifests in our doing. What does that mean? It means that who we are in Christ Jesus, first of all, you need to believe who he says you are, not what you feel, not what others say. Forget about what you feel, forget about what others say, and focus on who he says you are. Your identity, my identity, is our being manifest, therefore, our doing it's not one or the other it's not just be doers and it's not just be beers beans <laughs> beers it's 
both are one. If you are in Christ Jesus, therefore you will do what Christ's done. John 5, 19. John 5, 19 in the Amplified Classic. So Jesus answered them by saying, I assure you most solemnly, I tell you, the son is able to do nothing of himself, of his own accord, but he is able to do only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does is what the son does in the same way in his turn. Likewise, that's what we are meant to do. So I'm not boasting about the righteousness and what we can do anything through Christ Jesus. There's the key through Christ Jesus. Are we the righteousness of God? Absolutely. Are we made perfect in God? Absolutely. But I'm not talking about that righteousness that comes from the flesh, because as the word of God said, says the, uh, our righteousness is but filthy rags before the Lord. I'm talking about his righteousness. And we put our faith in his righteousness, in his perfect and complete work. Then he equips us and he helps us through the journey. And he works in and through us, just like Jesus. We are who Christ says we are. Therefore, we'll do what Christ tells us to do. Because of Christ in us, the hope of glory. Again, I mentioned that. As believers, our identity is fully established in Christ Jesus. But that revelation and that witness unto the world, the evidence of that truth, is only made complete by its manifestation, by fruitfulness in our doing. Now, fruitfulness, let's get this right. Fruitfulness doesn't just mean to have a great car, a great house, a big ministry with lots of employees. Of course, that is. Of course, that does carry some weight. Of course, but don't misunderstand fruitfulness because God, when he talks about fruitfulness, he's not talking just about that. He's talking about how many lives you are transforming, how many lives you are touching, how, many, how much of the kingdom of heaven you are releasing here on earth, how much glory you are bringing to God as his ambassador, how you represent him through your life. Hence, faith without works is dead. So in the journey of life, we must learn to spot, and this is important because I've been telling you that he will reveal the end from the beginning. He'll give you those words. He'll give you that expected end. He'll give you those amazing prophetic words and all that. The, he'll show you the end from the beginning to motivate you, the harvest. But then we need to realize that there has to be seeds along the journey. Amen. And there has to be some time for those seeds to grow. Well, in the journey of life, we must learn to spot, to discern the needs or the demands in front of us and meet them by faith. What do you mean by needs? In a very simple and practical way, somebody knocks on your door. You go open up the door. You see this person is sweating and they're like, would you like to buy these artworks? And you go, who's that? Did you, did you do it? Oh, no, we're, we're selling these artworks as uh, to raise funds for charity. And uh, it's for this, this, and so. And then she starts explaining what it is. And you go, no, I can't buy it. However, would you like something to eat and to drink? You look like you, you're you having a long day. Would you like to come in? I'll love to offer you some water or whatever. That's meeting a need. As simple as that is meeting a need. We've done that. In fact, that little story that I just told you, it ended up, it ended up in an amazing testimony. We ended up bringing that girl inside. And obviously, I was with, you don't do this if you're alone. You do this with other people. So my wife was there. My kids were there. We brought her in. We gave her some water. We gave her some juice. In fact, we ended up having a conversation with her about Jesus and all that. She was she was a, a, an international student from overseas, from somewhere in South America. She had gone through such a really, really bad moments and, and to, to be able to even come to Australia, even though she was only here as an international student. And guess what? It was her birthday that day. And she was working and she had no time to even celebrate her birthday. And she had nobody, no family, no friends, nothing. So we said, Really? Let's celebrate your birthday. Seriously, we've done that. And guess what? 
we hear another knock on the door. We go and open the door and dad is there. My, my wife's father is there. He opens the door and he just says, look, I just came from work. I've got these Danishes, all these cakes that he bought from somewhere on, along, the, along the journey home. And I just wanted to give this to you guys and to the kids and I need to go home. And that's it. And there's enough Danishes for every single one of us. There's five of us in the house, plus this girl makes six. There was enough for all of us. So we put all those Danishes together. My wife puts a nice and beautiful, puts a little candle that we had a candle. At. We sing happy birthday to her. The girl's in tears. We start ministering to her. She opens up. We start ministering, praying for her. That's meeting a need. That's meeting a need. And you don't have to go that far. You can go to a shopping center. And if you listen to Holy Spirit and you go, see that person in front of you, pay for their groceries. We've done that before. But God, they look more rich than I do. Don't worry about how they look in the flesh. Listen to the voice of God and be obedient. You'll be surprised by the amazing things and the doors that God will open up just through acts of kindness and love like that. So the needs we meet will take us to the ends we need. The needs we meet will take us to the ends we need. God wants us to be needs focused, not end focused. Whilst the end inspires, motivates us, reignites, stirs up and, and hunger within us. The problem lies, as I said before, when we have, when we become, I mean, obsessed with the end, turning us into ruthless masters instead of humble servants. Therefore, the key lies in recognizing the needs created by the end and ultimately meeting those needs by faith along the journey, sustaining, growing and moving us closer to the desired expected end. John 15 verse 16. John 15 verse 16 in the New King James Version. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. And that your fruit should remain. That whatever you will ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Why are you still waiting? Well, we've just been talking for the last 15, 20 minutes about it. But this verse explains it perfectly. Because a lot of the times we think we just need to be uh, spending hours and hours in prayer, go to church every week, and that's it. And God will just reward us for that. There is nothing you can do. For the rest of your life, you could be the most sinless person in the world. That does not qualify you for God's righteousness or, 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 or even salvation. It's not that that qualifies you. It's His goodness. It's His grace. It's what He has already completed. It's nothing, nothing that you do. All He asks from us is our hearts, our love and our faith. Whilst you're here on earth, you need to live by faith. We must live by faith. We are faith-fueled believers. John 15 verse 5. John 15 verse 5. Amplified classic. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever lives in me and I in him bears much abundant fruit. However, apart from me, cut off from the vital union with me, you can do nothing. Remember, it's not one or the other. We live by faith, and faith without works is dead. Therefore, faith has to look like something. Love has to look like something. Jesus, wherever he went, he didn't just set them free. He didn't just do miracle signs and wonders. Some of the, the miracle signs and wonders he did was also providing for those around him. Remember the fish and the loaves? But all those people that walked around with him, there had to be provision. He has to look like something. The kingdom of God looks like something. He doesn't want us to, 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 to act povos and... No, that is, he took upon himself on that cross all the poverty, all the sickness, all the sin, everything, so that we could have abundant life. So we could live, truly live our lives, bringing him glory and honor. Amen? 
I want to conclude with a very wise advice. Because we've learned today, we've answered two very important questions. And in answering these two important questions, in discussing these two important questions today, we've learned that we can live free from the whys. And spirit-led, mature Christians don't ask why anymore. But ask what and how. Stop asking why. Start asking what and how. What do you want me to learn from this, Lord? And how do you want me to handle this? What do you want me to learn from this, Lord? And how do you want me to handle this? And I want to finish with our main verse today again. And I'm going to bring up the main verse, but in the message version, because I love the way it explains it. As you can see on the screen, consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know that under pressure, your faith, faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. Amen. Amen. All right. If you are new here today, and this is the first time you are listening and, 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 and hearing about the Christian God from this point of view, then you haven't heard anything yet. And this is a divine appointment for you. You are not here by accident, by fluke. There's no such thing. It's a divine appointment. And all you need to do, as you're about to see on the screen, is cry out to God. Romans 10 verse 9 to 10 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Come as you are. He'll take you as you are. And don't worry, he'll, he loves you too much to leave you where you're at. So he will transform you along the way. But come as you are. For with a heart one believes unto righteousness, and with a mouth confession is made unto salvation. And guess what? He doesn't leave you like that. Once you give your life to him, he doesn't leave you alone, without any weapons, without any protection, without any provision. No. As you can see, now on the screen, Titus 3 verse 5, Ephesians 2 verse 8, Acts 1 verse 8 goes on to tell us, then he saved us by grace, through faith. So it's grace. It's, it's something, it's not even mercy. It's grace. You don't, you don't deserve it. We've done nothing to deserve it, but he just wants to give it anyway. It's a gift. And you take that gift by faith, the gift of God, washing away our sins. And sins in the most simplistic definition is when we live our lives without him. When you live your life and you say, no, I don't need God. That is a sin because you were created in his image. Out of all creation in the world, you and I are the only ones created in God's image. Humanity was created in God's image. Wow, that's amazing. And he loves us and he cherish, it cherishes us more than anything that is created. Washing away our sins, giving us a, the new joy of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. This is what I spoke about, Christ ambassadors. He will receive power. He won't leave you alone. Holy Spirit, what is that? That is the very presence of God. That is God himself in the Spirit will come and live inside of you. And all you need to do is ask him to come. We call that the baptism of Holy Spirit and fire. You will ask him to come. He'll come. He'll come and he will fill you with his presence. He'll kick out all the squatters, all the demonic squatters and all the bad things that you've, that you've idolized over the years. He'll kick them out. And he'll come and live inside of you. And you become his temple, his synagogue, his church, whatever you want to call it. And he will remain with you at all times. And then he will teach you. He'll guide you. He'll correct you. He'll love on you. He'll comfort you through your life journey. How good is that? Let's pray together. Amen. I want to pray for you. And I want to thank God for this opportunity. Lord, I thank you for my brother and sister who's watching i thank you for their decision to make you their lord and savior even now as i pray lord you you breathed 
on your disciples and he said receive the holy spirit so in faith i breathe over my brother over my sister that's watching this in jesus name receive the holy spirit lord send fire all of us we want a fresh feeling a fresh infilling of your spirit and fire fill us afresh with more we want more in jesus name amen and amen congratulations welcome back to the kingdom family i encourage you please get connected with a bible teaching holy spirit filled church you need brothers and sisters in christ around you to help you in your journey and also to give you an opportunity a safe place where that you can serve where you can serve where you can be served where you can encourage others where others can encourage you and where you can continue to grow in your journey as a believer amen a man this brings us to our second part of the program which is called the collective where i spend time with those that are watching those that are listening and i pray for you prophesy whatever holy spirit leads me to do i encourage you to hang around if you're new here or even if it's the first time you're watching drop us a line tell us where you're from hi brother from botswana hi i'm from mongolia hi i'm from china wherever you are praise the lord we always love to hear from you and it's always inspirational to us as well to know that there's other brothers and sisters around the world sharing enjoying the living word of god amen amen this brings us to the collective